podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Oh, it's a goal. Who got the assist? Who got the assist? Hello everyone, sorry we're a day late. Yes, we had some very rare scheduling issues yesterday on my side. I mean, we've had to come at you 24 hours later than planned, but it's international break and we thought it'd be all right, to be fair. Plus, we're back to news of a new England manager, which we otherwise wouldn't have known about, Sam, with Fab Romano. Here we go in, Tommy Tushel, or Tuchel. I need to remember, we'll try to figure out which one it actually is. I think it's Tuchel, isn't it? As the next man in the impossible jobs hot seat. Uh, BBC has just confirmed it as well, so it looks like it is happening. Exciting times. Anyway, hope you're all doing well. I spent last week not really enjoying the break in so much as being pretty laid low with man flu or maybe even COVID passed me by my beloved toddler. So please excuse any coughs, sneezes. I don't make the mic for in this one to mute it. And I'm joined today, as always, by Sam. Hope you had a better week than me, mate. How are you getting on? Yeah, all good, thanks. Yeah, no illnesses on my side. So uh, if you do have a bit of a coughing fit, you can mute yourself and I'll ramble on for a couple of minutes here and there. So hopefully I'll be able to cover any of that off. Um, we are, as always, who got the assist. On today's pods, um, as seems to be very popular this week in the content world, we're zooming back a bit, um, back in, sorry, after the step back with Nick last week. A great pod, by the way, if you haven't gone and seen that or listened to it already, do please go and check that out from last week with Nick, who is flying extremely close to the sun at the moment in the giddy top 500, I think. Um, so, yeah, do go and check that out for pearls of wisdom from him on how how to get to that sort of rank at this point in the season. Today, though, we will be having a look at the next quad of fixtures. So game weeks eight through to 11. Um, and obviously that leads us up prior to the next international break, the final one um, before the turn of the year. Tom's produced a very decent spreadsheet. In the notes, he's put little spreadsheet, but I can tell you it's very, very impressive. So do make sure you go and check it out on YouTube if you're listening to the pod version if at all possible. Um, and all of this will be detailing the non-pen XGI data and the FPL points for the now uh, traditional whistle stop tour through all the teams and the key men, plus our thoughts on where we're looking to go from here with all of them. Plus, of course, we'll take a look at the game week ahead, um, which obviously at one point was looking very juicy with a Saka potential injury, but it's cooled down a little bit now, maybe a little bit less tasty than before. Um, albeit one of us at least might be ready to throw a little bit of a chaos grenade in there as well. It is Tuesday, the 15th of October. The vast majority of the international break games have been and gone. And a quick shout out before we go ahead with uh, FPL meets this weekend. We always try to shout them out. 19th of October in London, as always, um, do go and check them out on Twitter at FPL Meets if you want any further details on that. I can vouch for it. Tom can vouch for it as regular um, attendees. It's absolutely amazing. Great laugh, especially if you've never been before. Do not be worried at all. It's all a welcome. Very, very good fun. In the meantime, though, shall we uh, crack on with the game week review and do a very quick summary, Tom? Yep, yep. So we went for it last week in a bit, a little bit more detail, although perhaps we should have done that this week because, you know, we're, we're kind of zoomed back in now. But yeah, last week, end up with the 58, which was OK. Um, basically, the big thing I did was that Luis Diaz, we got the news, what seems like a decade ago now. So much has changed, Sam, <laughs> that Brennan, that um, he wasn't going to be starting um, in the early game. So I moved in Brennan Johnson last minute which is obviously quite a good goal. Probably could have got another one, to be fair. I just kind of skied it over the bar the second chance. And if Werner had found him in the first minute, you know, it would have been laughing. But hey-ho, pretty good. Um, no no captaincy bang. Harlan did nothing. Own Saka. And as I said last week, I was genuinely really surprised when I saw all the scores come through because I was out somewhere without any signal that Saka's 16-pointer was net very good. And the effective ownership was actually pretty low. So that was obviously a bit of a boon. Elsewhere, you know, the likes of Bumo um, scoring a penalty in, in the 5-3. Obviously, we probably could have 
got more. <laughs> we were hoping, but never mind. And uh, Trent with an eight pointer with a clean sheet. That was pretty much the week. And um, little things like uh, Johnson and yeah, Rico Lewis with the assist as well. And um, little things like that kind of really helped. I'm now up to 271k. So the recovery from Palmageddon is on. And I'm hoping with the next four. I can obviously get back to near the top 100k, but let's see how that goes. How about you? Well, yeah, nowhere near that at this point. I'm 1.5 million just inside, um, 56 points from game week seven, enough for a 570k green arrow, so absolutely fine. A couple of points off of you, and I do feel like I'm losing a couple of points in ground to you every week at the moment. Not that we're in direct competition, of course, but it's always nice to try and keep pace. Um, very similar team in terms of who actually returned for me. Uh, Alexander-Arnold, Lewis, Saka, and Bermo as well all returned. Um, the big difference between our two teams is you had Johnson. I went with the other Spurs attacker with Solanke, who had no shots on goal, which is, I think, a bit of a misnomer. Um, but did, of course, got, get the assist for the Johnson goal. So five points for him, 56 overall pretty happy generally and now i've got three free transfers to use over the international break so not so bad i'm pretty happy yeah and that chaos grenade could well be uh it'd be issued who knows with those free transfers in the pocket i've only got the one so probably more if there's a if i want to be proactive or maybe if uh there's an injury which comes out of the press conferences and sounds like this tuesday night recordings that we don't know yet uh, but yeah all speed covered off in a little bit so the main topic this week, so I promised last week, it's look at the 20 teams, what's going out, what's going down with them. On screen, it's the 4-2-0. We'll be smoking out the 20 teams uh, who are all sorted by Team XG um, shown, and it also shows the next four fixtures on the three-point scale because why not? Um, clever people like James from Planet FPL will look at bookies odds and things like this. I'm just a simple man, so all I did was do well, I mean, the, F the FDR has four points, so this is just even further distilling it down into good bad and somewhere in the middle because at the end of the day that's what you really need a uh, top end uh, non-pen sgi point scorer is also shown and the top fpl point scorer and the, there's also kind of it shows you if they're the same or different I don't worry if listening with of course talk you all through this but that's basically what's on the screen if you watch on youtube we'll go through this sort of team by team briefly mentioning where we think they are and how we see the next four and we'll talk about kind of the wider ramifications of this later on and we'll, we'll spend a bit more time i think it's fair to say on fpl sort of relevant teams just because we're not trying to put out a 150 minute special here we'll be ruthless on focusing on fpl relevance apologies if there's some burning niche player you really love that we just simply don't get to sorry about that let's go from the top term um, and mm -hmm. the top is actually spurs i think that it's one of those things that if you just told your average a joe in the street or Josephine in the street or whatever the other equivalent would be and um, that Spurs are the, currently the top the top team XG people would be like oh really that's a surprise but yes it's one of those teams which is out there and um, so they are top by not very much ahead of Chelsea point four next four and um, I've kind of labeled it as kind of some in the middle so West Ham at home Crystal Palace away Aston Villa at home and Ipswich at home which is obviously a good fixture the top um, score for non pen SGI is uh, Slanky, uh, 4.2, but that's not reflective in the top FPL scorer, uh, which is Madison with 39 points at the moment. They're one of seven teams with the top underlying data scorer isn't the top FPL point scorer. A couple of things with Spurs, Sam. So despite being the top for Team XG, Solanke, Madison and Johnson are only 9th, 17th and 19th for non-pen SGI, which maybe suggests a bit of sp like a spread of threat. But Solanke's only played five games. Um, yeah, and he's exactly. the only player in the top 20 there. And in fact, widening the top 30, there's only two players who haven't played six games or more. KDB in 30th and Son as well in 24th. So Spurs have got four players in the top 25 to for a non-pen SGI so far this season, which is it just kind of shows that there is a bit of a spread, but Slangy having those limited minutes means that perhaps um, he's going to eventually emerge as the talisman here. Um, what do you think of Spurs at the moment? I mean, they're, they're definitely, we've both got representative. Are you looking to add another one throughout the next four? Yeah, I'm certainly interested in doing so. Um, the XG as a team looks very promising. I would say that maybe it's a bit noisy after the Man United game. I, I seem to remember they accumulated something like five plus XG in that game alone. Obviously, those games need to be played and it all counts. Um, but we try to maybe take away the outlier samples uh, or the outlier examples rather um, from some of these, especially in a sm small sample size at this point in time. But generally, they look pretty impressive going forwards. Um, 
And I do imagine with the fixtures to come, a lot of them are grey here on the ticker. I actually think West Ham is probably a green in my own mindset. I do actually really like that as a home fixture. Yeah. So um, I think eight of the 11 goals, I, I think I saw this on Twitter somewhere that they've conceded have been through the centre um, from the centre forward of the opposition team so far. So Solanke hopefully can uh, get, get some returns in that one. And like you said, only five matches so far for Solanke. Obviously, Son has been injured as well. And then both being quite promising in the underlying data shows to me that there's probably more to come from Spurs when they have their best possible 11 playing. Um, weren't Werner playing on the left wing for the majority of those minutes where Son hasn't been has led to, I would say, some missed chances, let's say. So I would imagine yeah. that with the fixtures to come, they could even improve from this. So, yeah, I'm very bullish on Spurs right now. Unlucky in the points total um, in the league table, but XG-wise, it's a pretty much different story. And that's honestly the only thing we really care about at the moment. So, yeah, Solanke, very comfortable as an owner. I think the Brighton game, as I suggested a minute ago, was a little bit of an outlier. I think they used him as that classic sort of Harry Kane deep, deep lying forward role with the wingers sort of going in beyond him and he can get the ball on the half turn and play them through which obviously is basically how Johnson got his goal as well so yeah. I think it's important to remember the game or two before that he got four big chances um which is very very decent for any striker so yeah still very bullish on Spurs Madison also equally impressive very good on the bonus points yeah like them don't really have any faults and well priced as well in on the on the whole yeah, uh, Solanke is a fifth for XG per 90, which is obviously very encouraging. Um, yeah. I wouldn't take last week um, as, as m much of anything. Um, I do really like Brennan Johnson as, as, basically as a, as a Watkins owner. Like if, if you own Watkins, maybe you own like a Jackson or something, you might not be in too much of a rush to move it on. Or indeed, if you set up with uh, Haaland and then maybe someone a little bit cheaper, like uh, I saw that the FPL General's got uh, Calvert-Lewin, for example, in that slot, or may maybe later on that would be a Cunha or something like that. I wouldn't be you know i'd be kind of thinking oh, okay well johnson's actually quite decent um obviously he has that sort of run of quote-unquote form at the moment and last year as well I remember the home brews i did at the start of the season johnson's non pen xgi for 90 was was the highest of those between 5.5 and 7.5 at the start of the season and it's kind of showing at the moment in how he's playing at what one of those that you kind of feel um, just will get his goal <laughs> no matter what. He did go off half time in the Wales game, um, and mm. uh, it was just he took a, he took a kick and felt something. One to watch, obviously, could be a one week wonder for me. Whoever who knows, I um, think he's yeah. meant to be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure it'll be absolutely fine. I think he was suspended from the next game anyway. Exactly, so absolutely fine with that. Uh, the other, and the other thing to kind of mention here is that um, they've managed to get this um, with playing quite a few quite on paper at least expectations from last year tough tough uh defenses so they've played newcastle thus far they've played arsenal thus far played brentford who have admittedly not been the defense of old and they've played united who have actually i think they've got the most clean sheets of any team haven't they yeah four so far yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no behind liverpool maybe just but behind oh yeah yeah no you're yeah. right just behind liverpool and yeah. um, so they've got there with a couple of a couple of potentially on paper tough games um in the funnel um and that kind of i guess Stokes excitement for the later games, as you said, probably the West Ham game. I was being a bit, um, a, a bit harsh to, to call that a uh, harsh. No, I, I was being a bit, uh, a bit too kind to West Ham, perhaps, for, by saying that that's a, a middling game. I'd want to mention Pedro Poro, Sam, and um, FPL review in particular is obsessed with me getting Poro in to the extent that alongside Bruno Fernandez, alongside Ebieze, I'm gonna, I have to exclude him um, from any solvers. Um, the SGC is not awful. They're actually seventh for SGC, but it feels like they're not going to be keeping clean sheets anytime soon. And I feel like I'd be happier elsewhere, but just because defenders are so contingent on those, uh, on not not conceding basically this year in order to get to the bonus. So for me, he's he's not really on radar. But I mean, is he on? The, is he is he of interest to you? Yeah, he's definitely of interest to me. Um, Spurs defensively have been a little bit better on the data this season so far. So I. I always want to be careful not to just get bedded in belief systems from the previous season. I don't think they're going to turn into prime Arsenal or anything defensively. But if we can bank maybe an extra two or three clean sheets across the season from them compared to last year, that brings them up to 10, 11, I think. And that might not be that bad if you consider Porro to still be as attacking as he was last year. And that brings me on to my final 
point on Poro and maybe the one hesitation I've got with him is he doesn't seem to be getting as involved in the attacking movements until later on in the game mm. at the moment. And I just wonder if he's been told to just play a little bit more within himself from an attacking sense. And he's still getting decent data. So maybe this is more of an eye testing and I'm, I'm reading it wrong, but it certainly doesn't seem like he's as involved in those final balls across or final box movements towards a shooting opportunity with these next four games though like you said they've already played some tough ones so maybe it was just a tactical thing for those matches and he's going to get forward against West Ham at home against Crystal Palace away against Ipswich at home almost certainly and if he does then he's still getting the data to prove himself pretty decent at that price he's certainly far far from a must own though at this point and I I am umming and ahhing whether or not he could be a potential replacement even for a Trent, let's say, for the next few game weeks, given the fixtures and the fixture swing that we'll come on to with Liverpool in a moment. I mean, it's, it's decent enough involvement, but it's it's not quite to the level that and maybe that's kind of... That we'd expect, yeah. Yeah, and may, maybe that's sort of collaborated by what you were saying um, with with um, the, the eye test and how he's playing at the moment. So, yeah, yeah. Well, one, always one to monitor. Um, but at the same time, I think that there's always the argument with a player like Trent where you kind of say, OK, he's basically a Liverpool attacker and playing in defence. I'm, I'm not quite sure it quite works with Porra at the moment. I think last year it did and not maybe not so much now, yeah. With, with Johnson being there. I mean, Madison is the top kind of point scorer. I mean, James from Planet FPL says he's not going to be getting uh, far enough forward, really, to, to score enough goals to justify that price, the price differential uh, between Johnson and, and Madison. I was speaking to FPL Mayor, I think it was on on Twitter um, about this as well. And I said, you know, the 0.9 this year is going to be so useful elsewhere, especially when you come, when you come to kind of the game week 12 strategy, which we'll talk about at the very end. Um, it just kind of doesn't quite work for me uh, to go with Madison, albeit that if he does score, and those bonus are likely to be coming home to him, aren't they, really, given how involved he is. Brilliant. Okay, uh, so on to Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea up to second. Um, got a very kind of scary uh, next four, I think. Uh, Liverpool away, Newcastle home, Man United away, and Arsenal at home. Um, Liverpool away probably should be red in this rather than rather than the mayor, but there we go. And unsurprisingly, Cole Palmer, who's top for non pen SGI at the moment, um, is the top scorer for them, and he's top uh, just all over. And he's a joint top scorer in FPL as well, with 67. Uh, Jackson's worth mentioning too, Sam. Um, third for non pen SGI, equal with Haaland right now, and currently ahead of the likes of Saka and Salah. Um, seven goals and assists this year. A cut price addition alongside Palmer, potentially. I mentioned him earlier on as a player that you maybe wouldn't want to be moving on elsewhere if uh, you did own him not sure you trust him to cover Palmer though it does feel like it's a case of kind of Palmer or nothing uh, with Chelsea and if you don't go with Palmer now it's kind of just hoping that the players that you've got as we discussed last week are going to be able to, con- to just take him on effectively and match him so your Johnson's your well, who have I got in, in, in that scenario it, your your Bumos whatever um, are able to match uh, what Palmer's giving um, to his owners yeah so Palmer's a real conundrum at the moment if you don't already own him especially if you're not on a wild card I think if you are I'd probably just take a chance and just have him straight from the off um, and just get that move done because inevitably you're going to want him soon enough. I would actually argue that game week nine is relatively the start of their decent run. Um, Once Liverpool's out of the way, this fixture tick is going to look a lot different over the next stretch. It looks quite negative now because two of the next four are pretty poor, Liverpool and Arsenal in eight and 11 respectively. Once one of those is out of the way, I can make peace with just one tough game and that would be the Arsenal home fixture. I'm not worried at all about home to Newcastle. Newcastle don't tend to travel very well um, and I expect Chelsea to get a very decent amount of chances in that game. Man United away from home, very similar feeling there. Not scared about that at all, despite what we've said about Man United's clean sheets. And even in those two fixtures, Liverpool and Arsenal, I'm... Palmer is the sort of player, and I I tried telling myself this at the start of the season and forgot almost instantly, but these mercurial talents that are the two, three best players in the Premier League, you're looking at the Sackers, the Palmers, the Haaland's, maybe even more so with Palmer than with Haaland at this point. He can create these moments against any team himself. All he needs is to pick up the ball somewhere in the opposition half, and he can create these chances even against the best defences. 
And you wouldn't put it past Chelsea to score one goal, let's say, against Liverpool or against Arsenal. If they do, so far, there's, I think, a 69% chance that Palmer's on the end of it in some way, shape or form in terms of assists, wild. goals. Absolutely yeah. Wild. yeah, it's crazy. So I think, even again, even if Chelsea only score one goal in those games, you're playing the odds a little bit. Palmer's most likely to get the goal or the assist there. And if there's a if it's a low scoring game, which I'd expect both of them to be, he's a, got a decent chance of bonus points too. So genuinely, I wouldn't be scared of owning him in any of those four fixtures. And there's quite a large part of me just shouting like, why don't you just bring this guy in immediately, get it done, and then you just don't have to worry about it from now on. Yeah, talisman theory is epitomised and it's certainly yeah. one that we'll discuss in just a little bit actually And um, when we get on to the game week 12 onwards. Uh, defensively doing okay as well. Uh, Nick owned uh, Roger Sanchez, uh, Robert Sanchez, sorry I call him Roger Sanchez because of the DJ in the 1980s. Um, <laughs> who uh, I'm sure will end up being eventually uh, dropped. But at the moment, he's doing all right. Uh, obviously, there's Jorgensen, the stalking horse. And Colwell at 4.6, he was actually in my a lot of my wildcard sort of drafts. Seems like the yeah. um, the ever-present there right now. Um, I'd suggest that if you're a wildcard in game week 12, he, that would be kind of when you were, you kind of go for it. They've got a really, Perfect. really nice run, to be honest. Like After the Arsenal game, they didn't play another top six, another top, team effectively of other than Spurs actually in game 15 all the way until the 25th of January at game 23 when they play Man City so a really really nice long run and um, he'll be a, a player that I'd be looking at to be honest and yeah. a good a good Christmas too so if he is sort of looking like the kind of guy who's going to be playing uh, the 90 minute man yeah uh, so that, far. Looks all, that looks all good um to yeah. me and um, so he'd be one again who's who's kind of in mind but yeah overall I'm definitely surprised this haven't they Sam yeah, for sure. They look a lot more coherent, much faster than I imagine they would be. Obviously, it seems to be regular upheaval at Chelsea season on season. I was surprised they got rid of Poch. But so far, that decision seems to be a fairly prudent one. Maresca seems to know exactly who his strongest eleven is, knows exactly which player is the backup in each of the attacking positions. And I really didn't expect that after seven or eight game weeks. I thought there'd be a lot more guesswork when it comes to us trying to figure out who the starting 11 would be every week. And whilst I'm sure they will rotate as fixture congestion comes, there's a fair few players that you could put good money on being on that starting 11 week in, week out. Palmer obviously being one of them, not registered for European competition, which is absolutely ideal. Um, but there's quite a few of those names, Colwell being another, that you can rely on pretty much every single week. Um, and yeah, the, the depth they've got to come off the bench around the 60, 70th minute every week, they look really impressive and they look well drilled as well. So yeah, there'll be a factor and I'm not massively surprised to see them up here in the XG at the moment either. No, and I think that you're definitely going to be interested in Palmer all the time if you don't own him and fearing yeah. him if you don't. It feels very sort of Mo Salah, doesn't it, of old and talking Mo Salah, let's move on to Liverpool. Mm. We've all jumped off, haven't we, really? Um, apart from, well, all, but a lot of people have jumped off. I've still got two. <laughs> and Diaz is now being sold heavily, the most sold player of all. Uh, next four, they've got three at home. Um, they've got Chelsea at home, Arsenal away, Bryson at home and Villa at home. Uh, I, I'd venture that at least two, if not three of those, i.e. the home fixtures, you're not going to be too worried about them in terms of an attacking sense. Um the next big good game is in game week 12 is Southampton. Um, but then there's also kind of City and then Newcastle. I'm not sure if we're classing that as a difficult fixture or not at the moment after that. Um, Diaz was massively overperforming his XG, Sam. He was the fifth highest. Uh, 2.4 more goals than he should have scored. Uh, Salah, unsurprisingly, the top underlyings and also the top FPL scorer uh, for Liverpool. Uh, Twas ever thus. And the best XGC as well. Um is Trent vulnerable is, is, is a question we should probably come on to in a second. But yeah, I mean, Liverpool have um, looked like they've adjusted pretty well under Arno Slot. They're only, uh, they're level actually with Man City. I don't know, I put Liverpool first just because we've got a little bit of a, a, a tangent on City to go into. But I mean, they're also, they've also been one of those teams that feels s semi-situational almost. Is that right to say, Sam? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And I think the reason they're semi-situational is because of the way Arno Slot rotates his side very effectively and we saw that at, um in the Eredivisie last year and in seasons past as well he does tend to bring off even his strongest players after 70 75 minutes 
at fairly regular, fairly regular, consistent intervals. And we thought maybe Salah would be immune to that. I'm not so sure that's the case anymore. Um, and at 12.7, I think he is now. Is that just too much to have someone who's only playing 70, 75 minutes a match when he needs to be rested for a European game, for instance, or when we get to the Christmas period and the congestion is f pretty tough for them? The same goes for Luis Diaz, of course. Um, he's another player in those positions, those wing positions that Arneslot does like rotating. And there's a lot of competition in those areas as well. Gakpo's playing well. Darwin, whilst obviously he's a little bit of a running joke for FPL managers, he's still a decent quality striker that will be demanding minutes at times. At the moment, Jota seems like the flavour of the day, but in two, three weeks' time, I reckon there will be a benching for him at some point, or at least he's taken off at 60 minutes, maybe even 59. Everyone gets annoyed, asks whether it's the time to sell him as well. And we're just going through that at the moment with Luis Diaz. I think with him in particular, it's all the more... Um, important to talk about it now because we're coming off of an international break where on the back of the last one he was going to get benched and slot did say as much as well it was only the fact that Gakpo came back injured that they had to start Diaz effectively so I do genuinely expect a benching for Diaz in game week eight against Chelsea after Gakpo performed well as well so that's concerning and I think with all of those factors in mind that is probably why Liverpool attacking assets are situational. You can own them for a good run of fixtures, back the 70-minute men to perform to the level they need to, to still get decent returns for you. Because they're a great attacking side, the XG is fantastic, of course, but you can't go on XGI per 90. You've got to do it on basically a per 70, 75 basis for a lot mm. of these players. And Salah's two million more than the likes of Palmer, the likes of Saka, the likes of Son, who are all putting up very similar, if not slightly better numbers at the moment. Yeah, it's one of those where I think with Jota especially, I had him on the preseason thing as being like, you know what, if this guy's starting, he's like a, a must own effectively because of the points per ninety and the uh, and the underlying data per ninety as well. It was just it's just ridiculous really how good Jota is at that price. It's just as you said, the reservations surrounding minutes and the reservations surrounding the competition, which can be a little bit off-putting, especially if you have other individuals around the price bracket or below the price bracket who are providing that consistency. Um, but Liverpool, as you say, are, are a very, very good attacking side. It's just if you've got like the likes of Bumo, uh, the likes of maybe going forward Johnson um, providing uh, the, 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 the certainty of starts and near certainty of starts. and you know, it, It's all within that sort of area other than Salah of of players who within certain conditions was hoping to perform for you within decent fixtures and the, the fact that Liverpool's fixtures are a bit sort of mixed does kind of I suppose push you to think oh, okay is there anything else I can do are, are there any other ways I can gain an advantage from moving their players on mm. does that sense to Trent though is the question so pre-season you know we, we weren't too sure on Trent and then after a while it became clear that actually you know, that he's actually quite a decent pick at that at the seven million price point and um, I don't know whether there's going to be a little bit of a uh, reconsidering it's not not because of um reconsidering what Trent is as a player and what he as an FPO asset provides more that if I sell him for a Gavardio, I'll say, or sell him for someone a little bit cheaper, like a Poro, or even even further than that, I can then pour the money into basically making a freemium at the end. So owning by game week 12, Saka, Palmer, and Haaland all in the same team, which may be potentially optimal going forward. Um, it's always going to be a bit of a difficult sell, isn't it, Sam? I remember you know, is it Trent versus Leicester a few years back when everyone's mm. kind of sold him for one week and you end up with between one point. Yeah, and, and that's the sort of thing that kind of it weighs heavily on, on experience FPL managers' minds. But the next two, especially Arsenal versus Game Week 9, he's a player that you either play, you're never going to be benched the guy, so he's a, he's a player that you either play or sell, isn't he, effectively? I mean, is he vulnerable for any of your plans going forward? He certainly is for mine. Yeah, short answer, yes, he is vulnerable for sure. Um, the, he Look, he's absolutely fantastic. I'm very bullish on Trent. He's one of my bold claims this year that he'll get 200 plus points. Um, absolutely love him as an FPL asset. But 
The problem with Trent at the moment, he's running at about 0.48 XGI per 90, mostly on assists. I think 0.05 of it is goal threat so far. But that's a, a, on average, you'd expect some sort of attack and return, much more likely to be assists every other game. So far, he's been unlucky. He's only got one in seven, but he's still running at that level that you would expect one in every two. If we assume that that is more likely to be assists, which again, the data shows it would be, that is an extra three points every other game week. Now, that's great if you also can add in a few clean sheets here or there. And therefore, there's a decent chance at bonus as well. Anytime that Liverpool keep a clean sheet, he creates so many chances that he's likely to get bonus, even if he doesn't get that assist. If he does then we're looking at a very, very decent haul, of which he's gotten one so far this season, one 11-pointer. However, that's with some good fixtures we've had in the past. You'd expect the data to regress slightly against tougher opposition. You'd also expect the chances of clean sheets to regress slightly against tougher opposition. Chelsea, Arsenal, Brighton, Villa, Southampton, I think we're all okay with that. Then Man, Man City, Newcastle, as is that the next seven, I believe? Yeah, I think that's seven. How many clean sheets do we actually expect from Liverpool in that run, knowing that Kelleher will be the keeper, not Allison? Kelleher's a good number two, but he's not Allison. Um, I don't know how many clean sheets I'm expecting from them. And if it's not many, if it's let's say two or even one, then I think Trent is probably a sell. If it's three to four, then I'm probably more on the side of, OK, he's probably worth just holding on to because no, you can downgrade the Trent spot to, let's say, a Poro or an Ike Nori next week. That's fine. You've got two, three million extra to play with or 2.5 million extra to play with. If that gets you from a Diaz to a Palmer or a Diaz or some sort of eight million midfielder up to uh, Foden, does that points difference it is that points difference made up for with that second move. I think if Liverpool are keeping three or four clean sheets in the next seven, it probably doesn't. If they're keeping one, maybe two, which at the moment I'm more tempted to say is likely, then I think it probably does pay off and you take a gamble that Trent's data himself will regress slightly and the clean sheets will stay fairly low. It could bite you, but I would take a good bet that his ownership's also going to shrink a little bit over the next few and therefore it might not hurt you that much even if he does score the odds decent haul here or there in the next run yeah no that's that's completely true like uh, it is the vulnerability is simply that reliance on clean sheets as you say I've, i remember at the start of the season um fpl dot team uh, calculated all the loss bonus point sort of thing i think he, he lost five last year yeah or something like that which, is, which isn't loads and, and there's also um i had a look at this pre-season and edibizier tax obviously in mind but slots fire and order were second first and first best defense over the last his three years um uh, there so he does know how to run a tight ship um albeit you know, with clear caveats the thing is without reiterating your point in full it's, it's one where he might end up being a sacrifice to afford other things in the future. Uh, just just because of that, really. I, I personally love to keep him for the whole season. It's just whether I keep him at the expense of owning Saka and Palmer. Exactly. And and that's probably a fairly easy conclusion to come to um, about who gets sacrificed, really, unfortunately. Um, so it, it is what it is. Um, and I think that you know, sooner rather than later, I think probably the, the Arsenal game in game week nine is going to be offering a lot of people a convenient get-out clause for Trent uh, to be sold, and which will probably herald um, him going on to, to score a free kick, keep clean sheet, <laughs> and all of that sort of thing. So that's just the nature of FPL, isn't it? Yeah. But, I mean, hey, there we go with all of that. Uh, Man City, uh, equal with Liverpool on um, on uh, uh, Team XG. Uh, Harlan top for most things, except uh, uh, XGI, uh, which is Palmer. But streets ahead, best captaincy of the next two, um, Wolves and uh, Southampton. Uh, lots of people, including myself, um, considering the triple captain in game week nine. Uh, game week 10, uh, Bournemouth away. Game week 11, uh, Brighton away. None of them particularly worrying anybody. Uh, decent ownership for Rico Lewis. 
and some Guardiola's sort of dot, dot, uh, dotted around um, XUC, their fifth best. Um, you know, not sure they want. I want to add to Rico, but maybe Guardiola for Trent could be on the cards for Southampton just as a short-term sort of play, and then that gets taken down to afford uh, Palmer and uh, Saka later on. It, it does feel negligent, doesn't it, Sam? Um, over the next few to go without, especially the next two to go without a, a second city attacker. I feel like there may be a bit of a movement, and it's been quite. A quiet online um at the moment um it, it may be movement to, to look at Foden if he does okay versus Wolves to bring him Southampton at home just to get kind of get the the rewards on the table right now um and I, I think we're talking uh, normally we have the the game the game we preview the knee jerk maybe we bring that up to this spot because maybe Foden's the one who would probably encapsulate mm. the knee jerk really well would he be the one um and especially if Saka was out or was highly doubtful maybe kind of that would be even more personal but i mean there's a lot of chat about Foden. i just i don't know i i did say when i was considering my wild cards that obviously you're looking to forecast going forward and yes you know the past is the past but the player's got good quality etc et and so on and so on is now the time to to go for that and there's obviously rewards on the table aren't there yeah and i'll i'll say this now i think if you're if you're thinking, oh, I'll give it a week on Foden, I think you're going to miss it. I genuinely think you're going to miss it. Like Wolves, Southampton, as that, as that double is what you want him for. You don't want to miss the Wolves one. If he pulls that week, you've basically just got the one next fixture before. OK, it's a decent run still. But by that point, you're already going to be looking at uh, looking around thinking, oh, I, I could have Palmer. Oh, I could have Son, maybe. There's going to be other options and I just think if you're if you're the kind of manager who wants to take the chance on Foden, you do it now in game week eight when they've got the longest possible run of good fixtures left, knowing that he did start before the international break. He only got, I think it was 72 minutes, um, but he then also did start for England in one of the two games. He started, I believe, in the Champions League once as well. So he has been building up the minutes and you would think that now is going to be the time for Foden to reintegrate into the City lineup in full. That's not to say he's going to play every single game, but if you want the benefit from Foden, it's easier to just not try to predict which game he's going to miss and just own him for the lot, knowing that the explosive haul could happen at any time. He is a frustrating own when he's not starting every single week, but when he's fully fit, he proved last season that he can force himself into City starting 11 every single week. He became one of their most important players. And uh, I think it was Late Riser on The Wire mentioned and, and astutely noticed that he was actually playing as effectively ancillary striker in the match he did start in game week seven, I believe it was. And he was quite unfortunate not to get the cut back once or twice or receive the ball in dangerous areas. So I don't think we're far away from seeing a Foden Hall. And I don't think it's I don't think it's as outlandish as some people are maybe assuming that he just goes on a little run now. But if you're going to go for it, I, I do say just dive in headfirst now rather than giving it a week because Wolves and Southampton as a cluster are the two weakest defences so far. And you just you just don't want to miss the Palmer-esque mega hall. Mm and be a week late to that party when everyone else jumps on him as well. If he hauls against Wolves, everyone's going to be on him again in game week nine. I just think that's going to be too late. Yeah, it's a, a Chad Scott said in the chat that one in three games he's going to miss. And that's definitely a bit of a worry. Um, last year, we didn't quite see that because of De Bruyne, a long-term injury. Um, we need to kind of check in on that one. Even with De Bruyne out, he's um, been in and out of the team. Uh, just, it's just basically a really strong situational pick, isn't it? Um, you know, you've, you've got the fix in front of you, as you say, Sam. And if you do have the means to get there, then it's a punt that I don't think anyone can really argue with uh, to, to, to a large extent. Can somebody with quite a a team which is quite close to the, the the template as it were before to go to at the moment well i think most of the time you'd be looking at selling a saka wouldn't you not selling a palmer um is is that really where what you want to do at the moment especially considering after game week 12 you're going to want that player back and they have that underlying um, abilities just kind of do points in any game uh, albeit the saka probably is going to get assists for gabriel to nod in the big games 
it's worrying, isn't it? Um, whether whether he wants to do that, although the rewards are on offer. This is where the risk reward thing comes in the FPL and bites pretty heavily, and I wouldn't mind it at all. I'm not sure that we could do it. I'm not sure I could do it. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those where it, it comes down to risk appetite in the moment. It also comes down to, I, I suppose, your assessment of the situation in front of you. Um, do we need to see more, or do you just go for it? It's a big question. I don't know that it's one that we're going to be able to get to <laughs> right now. And uh, talking of Saka, um, uh, Arsenal a third best uh, XGC, um, despite playing uh, Villa, Spurs, Man City already. A bit of copium, Sam, for you and I on the on the double uh, defence. And um, next four, not. Uh, mixed bag. As we say, Bournemouth away, probably a decent fixture. Liverpool at home, <clears throat> a bit worrying, but it's at home. Newcastle away in 10, Chelsea away in 11, Saka top for the underlying and top for um, FPL points so far. Um, have us actually, not too far behind Saka. Those who did go for double attack have been award, rewarded, as mentioned last week, uh, just 0.4 of net GI behind Saka. And it's actually third for non net G overall, um, but a 14 point difference in FPL. A team, I think, where any sale, you basically are going to be boomeranging that at some point. So you've got to factor that into your planning. And I think that that in of itself may give you pause for thought, perhaps, on moving out an Arsenal player. Yeah, very well put. And I think that one opportunity here is because they're going into an iffy run. If you wanted to do a bit of restructuring by boomeranging for the next three weeks, let's say you've got double defence, but you kind of fancy Havertz alongside Saka, then maybe you could look at getting rid of one of those defenders for the next three. And then instead of boomeranging, boomeranging straight back to that defender or goalkeeper, you could upgrade a striker to Havertz for instance or the reverse of that if you didn't fancy Havertz you fancied Arsenal double defence you could shift away from Havertz maybe to a Solanke for instance for this little run where it's maybe a little bit iffy three away games in the next four of course and then you can get back to an Arsenal defender and double up in defence after that so there are opportunities there but I think with Arsenal, it's a bit like Man City as well. It's, the team quality is just so high. They are the difficult fixture. And despite the fact that they've got three away games in the next four, you, you back them to be the likely favourites in each of those games. So you still think they're going to perform well. And the only way I'd be getting rid of any Arsenal players this week is if Saka was indeed confirmed out, which I don't think we're going to get. No. No, definitely not. I think we can all reconcile ourselves with with, with the fact that our test is going to say, at best, we need to check on him um, at worst. Maybe he'll say he's not available and that will kind of open the floodgates. But I suspect it'll be somewhere in the middle where it'll be like, oh, I think he's all right, but we'll, we need to see. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's the whole usual, he's not in training or, oh God, you never know. I mean, last time, I think it might have been literally this time last year, <laughs> you had Bournemouth up next, international break. Again, limped off. Yeah. And uh, I took him out of my wild card. Sorry, wild got, card. Got a break? I, I, I think it might have been, actually. And yeah, then he paid the penalty to Erdegaard for the hat-trick That was well, it, I yeah. It was like yeah. four, it was four, it was, a, it was a four nil, wasn't it? Something like that. Mm. Oh, gosh. Four, yeah. One, yeah, four nil, four one, something like that, yeah. So, yeah, a bit of a holding pattern, I think, uh, with Arsenal at the moment. Um, oh. I think if you do own Saka if you don't hear anything um, then assume he's going to start I'm assuming he's going to start to be honest and take from there effectively um, maybe by game week 9 you may be looking at it and think oh okay well Liverpool Newcastle Chelsea that's enough for me to think yeah alright I'm going to go for Foden for three weeks but you've got to have a plan in place to basically mm-hmm. bring him back I, I think it or, or go to Havertz if, you, if you're that way inclined uh, Bournemouth are uh, next uh, Lim's interest for now I'd venture um, They've done very well, to be fair, um, to, to be below um, below that top five um, in the uh, Team XG and on 12.1. Um, Arsenal at home, Villa away, Man City at home, Brentford away and are on the next four. I think the FPL interest is very much limited to Semenyo, who's a top run lying, top for FPL points. Um, the run from game week 11 to 20 is actually really good F- FDR-wise. So if you are thinking that Semenyo is expendable, maybe you might want to think about it again. And if you do own him um, and you do wild cards, uh, when we all did in game week six, we all, a lot of us did in game week six, maybe you, you already had a plan for what you're going to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, one of those I think we can probably do briefly, Sam. Uh, anything, Sam Bournemouth? No, not at all. Just with Semenyo in mind, 
I'm pretty happy to bench him in one or two of those. And if I need to start him in any one of the next three, it, I don't think it's a nightmare. Um, he's pretty, well, not necessarily the talisman for Bournemouth, but he's pretty central to everything good they do. So I wouldn't put it past him to score in any one of those three tough fixtures. So yep. yeah, while, whilst there are other decent options at that price, I, I don't think it's necessarily worth the free transfer, um, considering the long-term uh, fixtures to come, as you astutely mentioned. Yeah, fair play. Um, so uh, Brentford, I think as well, a bit of an open shot case too. So in, mm. in the middle of that great run currently, uh, Man United away, Ipswich at home, Fulham away and Bournemouth at home. Um, XGC, pretty poor, uh, fifth and bottom, um, losing those uh, fullbacks seem to have really sort of rocked the paradigm in terms of how they're setting up defensively. Um, players missing Bumo will go there, as Nick was mentioning last week. It's, it's kind of the missing piece of the jigsaw for him. He's actually the second highest O performer, Sam, on goals minus XG right now. 3.2. He's scored five goals from seven shots on target, excluding one shot, one goal from a penalty last week. Uh, but yeah, I mean, a bit of a no-brainer at the moment. One of those where you'll pick up points for those for who, uh, whatever reason, won't go there. Um, the only note I've got on them, really, uh, I've got well three. Um, one happened to go with Flecken, despite Raya not returning the goods um, in ostensible gimme fixtures. Um, it's, just, it's one of those with Flecken. It just, it just never felt right. Um, Carvalho at 4.8, an interesting mm. option to go to. If Rogers' race is run prematurely, and Vandenberg at 4.0, they seem to be playing that five at the back. Um, fairly often so he could come in as being quite a decent um, just fixer enabler sort of character and um, fixtures are very good up into game week 14 when Bumo will probably hand over to Bowen for me yeah makes sense I, I mean whilst uh, Bermo is overperforming on his data the data itself is still good they look like a very coherent team as they always do under Thomas Frank and I can only see them continuing to run at about this level pretty much throughout the season he's a good price he's on penalties he's 90 minutes I I wouldn't overthink it he's just an absolute lock in my team at the moment um maybe Rissa coming back sometime yeah. soon we think could be an interesting option uh, moving forwards because when he starts his data is fantastic and he does get very consistent returns and with Tony gone you'd expect his place is much more secure but we have to wait for that and uh, for now um, Brian and Bermo absolutely fine by me yeah next international break isn't it for Rissa uh, yeah. for, uh, Man United are next. Uh, Bruno providing Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> it didn't quite come off. It's not quite come, come off for him recently. Uh, but people are saying uh, throughout the FPL Twitter sphere that he's an include on the game week eight wildcard. People are anyway. Uh, unsurprisingly, top underperformer for goals uh, minus XG. Um, Anana is the top scoring player um, due to those four clean sheets and seven, despite middling SGC. Classic United, who knows what the hell is going on there. As I said, I've a little bit like Nunez, I've, I've kind of quite quit on, Bru on Bruno, uh, but he's, he's not a player who's going to be out of the running for me. Those fixtures are actually not that bad, honestly. And, and the, kind of the run in going forward isn't that bad for United either. The next four are Brentford at home, West Ham away, Chelsea at home, and Leicester at home too. And I think, yeah, I said the, the mid run isn't bad at all for United. It's just who the hell is going to come through. I mean, it would be very nice, wouldn't it, Sam, if someone like a Rashford at 6.9 or a Garnacho at 6.3 now comes through and actually does start to look pretty decent because up until kind of the start of December, their run's more than all right. Yeah, they're just in a bit of a state of flux at the moment. And you'd imagine that the starting 11 becomes a little bit more guaranteed through the season when Ten Hag does figure out who his backed wingers are. You would think that Rash Rashford and Garnacho have good shots at it, but for the time being, they're getting early subs. They're not even starting some games. You just can't go there right now. And Bruno, I've already been burned by him this season. The data's okay, but it must be said, it's actually not that outstanding so far this season. 3.1 from seven games isn't brilliant um so i'm more than happy just to put him to one side for a considerable amount of time until man united look like more of a coherent unit um and we can much more quantifiably i guess rely on them for the numbers ev every single week mm. i just don't think we can at the moment so I, again it's it's cut partly the price with bruno there are just 
as good, if not better options who are also getting 90, who are also on penalties, who are cheaper than him. Um, so why do, why wouldn't you just go there? I don't, there's just too many good midfielders to fit Bruno in, in my mind at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those where you make massive gains because if, especially for an analytics bloke or person, and um, then and it certainly kind of makes sense from why, one angle. But as you say, the, the opportunity cost is pretty high. Uh, Fulham are up next, uh, not very far away from United at all, actually. Um, 10.8 to United is 11. Um, Aston Villa at home, Everton away, Bryson, uh, Brentford at home, sorry, and Crystal Palace away. Um, one of those teams, again, who are mismatched. So Traore, um, <laughs> rolling back the years, so probably all those one-on-ones he keeps missing, um, is the top underline scorer, and uh, Smith Rowe is the top point scorer. Um, I guess it's, what, it's, what, it's one of those, isn't it, where they're okay for long run, they're a very good source of, I guess, edge pieces. They've got a decent mm. XGC. They're eight for that. Uh, Robinson, Anderson, who's actually circling the drain um, to drop to 4.3, a player who's high in mind for me going forward, potentially is kind of one of those who's got a decent-ish Christmas. He has a 90 minutes. And there's this plethora of kind of mid-price, pretty decent midfield options that you're never going to buy. Uh, Traore, Pereira, and Awobi. <laughs> I don't know how you're ever going to arrive at any of those as a solution, certainly for the two of us, potentially. But if something did happen, like fair play, and up front, uh, Jimenez, um, the t- cheap striker right now at 5.6, rewinding the years a little bit. He's top for non-pen uh, XGI per 90, actually, uh, currently, which surprised me a little bit. One of those teams where it's not going to be, it's not going to make, make or break your season at the moment to not own one of those players, but nonetheless, a, a, a very handy team for those edge pieces, aren't they? Yeah, and it's nice that they've got decent players in pretty much every position as well. So if you're lacking a spot somewhere, then I wouldn't hate the idea of a Smithrow or a Traore in the field. I wouldn't hate the idea of a Jimenez up top or a Robinson or Anderson at the back. So, yeah, they kind of work out quite nicely just to round out your side. They can easily be your 11th, 12th men most weeks because... Fulham do tend to up their game even against the toughest opposition. So, and that's something we've seen over several seasons now under Silver. So they're they're never going to be terrible players to play, even in the toughest fixtures. So they're almost the ideal bench fodder most weeks. And they're at a price where you can have them as bench fodder, especially more so the Traores and the Smith Rose of the world, because Smith Rose is a little bit more expensive. But you're more than happy to just have them sat on the bench waiting to come on any given week. And Fulham are a very decent Premier League side. They've proven that over several seasons. And yeah, they're very reasonably priced. So yeah, I wouldn't hate anyone going for any of those options that you've already mentioned. Yeah, that's, that's literally it, isn't it? With, with Fulham, um, fairly decent. Uh, next up is Brighton, another one where the top FPL point score doesn't match the underlying. Um, they have uh, Matoma as the uh, top uh, underlying um, and then Welbeck, um, who's top scorer at the moment. Potentially skippable, I think. Um, tough run over the Wolves um, in game with nine for the next few. Newcastle away, Wolves at home, Liverpool, Man City, two, probably two of the three hardest games um, in 10 and 11. Uh, one that we probably skip and move on from. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Maybe I'm not afraid. something we need yeah. to. Yeah. yeah, back on the back on the menu game week twelve, that's for sure. Uh yeah. similar for West Ham, bit of an irrelevance for now. Uh, Everton eleven is okay. Uh, but another couple before you get to a nice little run up until uh, boxing day uh, for West Ham. Um, as I said, um I've got eyes on Bowen to take over from Bumo in fourteen, but it seems like they're in a, a bit of a team in transition, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. And I, I guess under new management, they were always going to take a little bit of time. But seven game weeks has been probably long enough. And you can understand why some West Ham fans were getting a bit frustrated. Um, but yeah, Bowen has been ticking along very nicely, regardless of that. Five five returns, is it, so far this season already? So yeah, a, absolutely fine player to own pretty much at any given moment of any season. He always ticks along nicely. And the fixture run, whilst not out standing uh, so, certainly nothing i'd be scared of owning bowen for in the immediate future and then like you say once the fixtures turn for brentford you can easily see yourself moving across to bowen and yeah i think he'll just be a good pick moving forwards i don't think there's much else other than him right now that you no. can reasonably look at though so this is probably another pretty short one yeah good old talisman theory of bowen he's, he's absolutely fine if you want to own him 
fair play, as I and so on, so on. Or West Ham, very middling for HTC as well. So maybe they'll offer up something when their fixtures turn, but not right now. Um, Newcastle too, uh, not lived up to the billing. Um, Isaac not gotten going at all. Um, there is a world where um, you know things transpire differently, and he's something one of those players. That we're also thinking, oh, you know what? Do we really want to sell him? But it's just not really worked. Um, doing well in the table, um, the, the overall table that is, um, the points table, in spite of their underlyings. Early December, I think, and certainly mid-January, they've got a very good run. But right now, it feels like they're kind of FPL relevant. Bryson at home, Chelsea away, Arsenal at home, Forest away. Uh, Gordon's their top underlying. Uh, Harvey Barnes is the top uh, FPL point scorer. Uh, but another one, I think, Sam, that we can just kind of leave for the moment. Um, moving on to Villa. Um, underwhelming, especially as I am sat with two of them. Um, the next three are actually all right. Uh, Fulham away, uh, Bournemouth at home, Tottenham away. Tottenham away, obviously, very good, good in attacking sense. And Liverpool away in 11. Uh, Watkins, unsurprisingly, top run lying at top for the points. Um, Defence, Sam, is the biggest surprise for me. <laughs> They're second best for SGC. That is a surprise. I didn't know that. <laughs> but you just don't see it, do you? It's the first clean sheet of the season against United. Um, and you're not going to be looking at any of their defenders, I don't think. Not even the goalkeeper. I mean, Watkins and Rogers realistically, are the only players in the mix. And it does feel like a case of don't buy, don't sell, really, with Villa, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly that. I wouldn't be looking at bringing in either of them right now. Um, I am a bit jealous of Watkins owners. I do think that the next three suit him quite nicely. So I certainly wouldn't be looking at moving him on yet unless it was to maybe bring in a, another premium in midfield with a little bit of a, a, a swap but uh, or a double move rather. So yeah, I mean, look, they've been slightly unimpressive or uninspiring in the league but you can understand that they're getting into the Champions League football again for the first time in a long time um, obviously great performance against Bayern um, and they're just trying to manage to fight on two fronts now or I know they were in Europe last year but it's a significant step up anyway so yeah I'm interested to see how long they're able to keep churning out results without the data necessarily reflecting that Um but the next three, not bad. If you own Watkins, if you own Rogers, they're absolutely fine. Rogers is still, in my in my mind, the perfect eighth attacker where you can just bring him on when the likes of a Semenyo has an Arsenal at home. You can rely on, on Rogers away at Fulham, for instance. So that's absolutely fine. But yeah, I certainly wouldn't be buying them at this point unless you're on a wild card and then you just want to fill out that eighth spot with Rogers in midfield. Yeah, certainly. I mean, it's yeah, decidedly mixed bag of fixtures um, going forward. I do think that they do start to again get pretty decent um, from kind of game week 13. I think it's going to be 14 actually onwards. They do have Man City in game week 17, which is, I think it might be boxing. No, I think 18 is boxing day. It's just for boxing day. Um, but one of those things where I think if you do own Rogers, you're just going to leave him there, aren't you? A, a very good enabler, not a Cole Palmer enabler, but still a very good enabler. But if you do own Watkins, I think you've got to be thinking about a bit of an exit plan just to kind of, I suppose, reallocate that money elsewhere. A bit of a trend almost that I'd like to keep him uh, long term. And I might do. Um, it's just that selling him in 11 for Cunha or even earlier uh, for Cunha, um, who we'll speak about in a little minute, does feel like it might be quite good just for freeing up some cash effectively. And yeah, all the other kind of responsibilities, as you mentioned, Sam, do seem to be dragging Villa down a little bit. And that is shown in the underlying data that we're getting to them right now um, in the SGC. What's that kind of putting them 12th? Mm. Uh, a little bit of a gap between mm. them and Saints. Um, uh, Saints do paradoxically run into a decent four. Leicester at home, City away, which obviously isn't great. Uh, Everson at home and then Wolves away. Um, Mr. Dibbling, <laughs> top for underlying and top for points. 18 points is, is top at the moment. That's not really too surprising, is it, Sam? Um, I, I wonder as well how much of uh, Saints is underlying um, team XG is because of that one game <laughs> so yeah it, it is one of those isn't it where uh, maybe that Newcastle game in game week one uh, when they when there was a red card is is informing where they are on this table mm. yeah there are there are moments where it looks like we could create quite a few chances but those moments are fleeting at the moment and I just 
with the next four fixtures in mind, we really need to get points on the board in um, three of those um, to stand any sort of chance in the league this season. So they're big, big matches. I'm just a little bit maybe confused with what Russell Martin currently thinks his strongest starting eleven is. I think the one thing that we do know, which is the only real relevant factor here for FPL, and that is obviously what this pod is for. It's not just for me to vent my feelings on Southampton as much as I'd love it to be. Um, but Dibbling does seem to be fairly secure in the starting eleven right now. And at his price, that is good value for money because his XG so far, not great, not XGI so far, not great. But it's important to note he's only just gotten into the starting eleven in the last few game weeks. So look, he's a very, very promising talent. I expect him to go on far beyond Southampton and achieve great things. And as long as he's in the starting eleven, I don't think you're going to find a better 4.5, 4.6 if he's had the price rise. I actually can't remember um, in the game. Yeah, it was 4.7 and then 4.5. So yeah, um, all right, on to the next one. Um, Crystal Palace, I think there may be another skip other than Eze, really. A 20th overall for non pin SGI. At one goal so far, but a few near misses. Owner's very unlucky. If you got that pen or the ref was less trigger happy, um, then maybe he'd be more of a consideration. But yeah, Palace and Toto, I thought they're a bit of a team in transition. Uh, next up, uh, Forest. Uh, Wood, um, good solid pick, I think. Uh, Mark and Crash Correspondence, he's got 12 or so goals in him. He's had four, will definitely get to 10. A good one to throw in if you need like a 90 minute man in the cheap sheet, cheap seats. Um, next four are uh, Chris Palace at home, Leicester away, West Ham at home, and Newcastle at home. Fourth best defense for next, you see. Decent Christmas as well. Milenkovic, boring AF, uh, but high on my list for bench men slash edge pieces once we see the X minutes become even more important as the calendar basically gets squeezed. So, yeah, that, that's kind of where I am with Forest. Yeah, completely agreed. Wood, yeah, seems like a very decent pick at his price as long as he continues to start games. Don't really see any reason that he wouldn't, considering how well he's been playing. I can see him getting 10 plus goals easily in the league great price and on penalties as we've now found out this season too so no complaints from me good next four fixtures and i expect him to score very well so if you're looking for a striker at that price point he's probably the go-to man right now yeah absolutely absolutely that's basically where it is isn't it just like they're edge piece heavy effectively those sorts of teams uh, everton as well um are, are very similar to that so mcneil um who i um didn't particularly um, expressed much enthusiasm for is now third for expected assists, the fourth highest over performer on goals as well. Sam, um, three goals, uh, with from five shots on target of an XG of 0.6. Um, Calvert Lewin hasn't quite worked out uh, for many people. I do think it can die at 5.4 is maybe the best cheapie, um, who's basically out there but yeah i mean the fixtures remain good for them i can see why i know you you're a, you're a calvert lewin owner sam and i've got michelenko you know they're, they're quite good just to hold until that december period i think kind of i think it's like game week 15 they then go into liverpool arsenal chelsea and man city i've got written down here which seems scarcely believable but wow zero points from those four fixtures i think um uh i mean they're okay for, for 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 doing a job, a situational pick, but it's one of those as well where you look at them and think, oh, there's always going to be a little bit of a, a roadblock. And I, I don't know, I just can't get enthusiastic about owning any of their players other than someone like Mikelenko that I can just keep on my bench. I mean, you own Calvert Lewin, and um, I'm assuming you may be looking at moving him on at some point soon. Not really, um, to really? be honest. Ooh, yeah, okay. I'm pretty happy. Um, I, the, look, I'm not, I'm not fixed on holding him, and there is a route that I could use him as a make way to get to much better players in other positions with a free, with an extra free transfer. So he's by no means a lock in my side. Thinking I absolutely love him, but I'm pretty happy to own. I don't want to be overly reactionary. His data is okay for a player of his price. He's on penalties. He's getting ninety minutes, and the fixtures are absolutely fantastic for the next few game weeks. So I'm in no rush to get rid of him. Um, mm. It's just if there's an extra 0.2, 0.3 that I might need to 
get myself up to a player I really want elsewhere, then I would be willing to get rid of him because I think there are other players that we'll come on to in a moment that are competing at his price point and just below that can probably near enough match him, if not maybe slightly better him. But no, I'm not that bothered by a couple of blanks for DCL. I think he's still absolutely fine to own. Yeah, I mean, it's very much kind of, you know, about your level of expectation, isn't it? Um, with a player like that and it, it makes a lot of sense and if you do own McNeil or whatever um, then yes so there's overperforming if you own Cavalier and yes um, the fixtures are all good and at that price level then it's absolutely fair enough I, I don't mind any of these players as an edge piece um, it's not worked out thus far but it could <laughs> with the fixtures, fixtures beget form and all of that. I wouldn't be surprised, Sam, if you do have one week where Cavaloon goes off and scores a brace and suddenly you're laughing. It's, it's just one of those, isn't it? Um, with a team like this, and it's all, all like this with the teams kind of around here. Um, Wolves are a good example of that as well. Um, up next, where you're... I, I, after the City game, things start to get a bit more interesting, don't they? So Brighton away, uh, Crystal Palace at home and Southampton at home, but the top of most fixture tickers um, after a horrendous start um, all the way pretty much until just before, well, maybe, maybe even New Year's. Mm. Um, so, so, I mean, Cunha probably is coming in for me to replace Watkins uh, versus Saints in 11 um, before that decent run. Cunha is actually the third best forward for bps this year like very very consistent um i think he's on pens as well i'm pretty sure he is and then um, eight nori as well um 4.4 for people who have been kind of mentioning him uh, about the place but i'm not interested in their fen- in their defense particularly for obvious reasons but i mean he could again uh, there's occasions where he's end up playing sort of left wing and um, so another one who could be potentially kind of of interest at a low price um yeah, I mean, I think, I think they're kind of one of those who are very situational. All of the assets are very different situational. We're not going to be touching them right now. Um, if you're on wildcard right now, you definitely kind of may be thinking about having Cunha or Strand Larson in place as your kind of your third, your third striker. Maybe you'd be looking at Ike Nori as being um, your bench man for this week and then kind of going forward, potentially him coming into the team. Um, I think they're going to be one of those teams who are going to provided they're not in a death spiral, which I, I think that probably this is just a result of how bad the fits have been. Um, one of those teams who are going to be maybe playing a bit of a bigger role in our teams going forward. Yeah, for sure. And I'm keeping a very close eye on Wolves at this point forward. They've been very unlucky with fixtures. I think one of those games uh, they were particularly poor in, but the rest are kind of, you can let them off a little bit. Um, yeah, I expect them to improve. Um, once Man City's out of the way, I think they'll be very, very interesting and a lot of people are going to start talking about them. Um, yeah, I overall love Ait Nuri at 4.4. I think he's going to be significantly underpriced. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, Leicester, um, we're up. <laughs> okay, we're in the bottom two now. Um, Fice up to 4.2, I've got here. Um, XGI. Uh, got a score of uh, the underlying data score is not matching the FPL point scorer and um, Vardy's underlying 1.2 non pinets shy. Oof, it's not great, is it? Um, I Dizzy think that, heights. yeah, compared to Calvert Lewin, I think that you can probably say that that's not worked out for people who've gone there. Um, Justin, um, who uh, um, has scored two goals, uh, from 0.4 XG, um, is is kind of the top point scorer for Leicester at the moment. I'm happy to skip that to be honest. Um, yeah. Like, yeah, no, the only edge piece I can see being worth it is probably Fice. I know um, FPL Harry, who's a lot cleverer than us, has Mavadidi. And I'm sure he's going to come through a 15 point of a Harry at some point. But there we go. Yeah. At the bottom, um, Ipswich, um, Dilap. Um, he's probably the, the player who um, is of most interest to a lot of people. Maybe they're Greaves. I'll speak about Davis in a second. Um, Dilap's the highest, um, their highest FPL point scorer, 31. He's the third highest over performer in terms of um, goals versus XG. A few have gone there for cheapies, as I said. So Greaves, Davis, um, D- Davis said, I'm not expecting miracles. They're bottom for SGC. I was wondering as well, Sam, if that was underpinned by just Liverpool and City and games one and two. But no, there's high numbers everywhere. <laughs> Um, 2.4 SUC versus Saints, 3.7 versus West Ham. I mean, they're much better at home um, and the fixtures are good. Um, but it's one of those where you've got to be thinking, this is like your 11th player, your 12th player. Uh, you don't want to be 
packing your team out, even though they've got good fixtures, newly promoted team. I mean, if you've got like a, if you're relying on like a Davis and a Dibbling in your 11 every week, you've got to be wondering, have I properly managed this? <laughs> Is that fair to say? Yeah, I mean, I've seen some fairly unbalanced looking sides with not much depth and relying on a few of the promoted clubs players actually doing very well so far this season. So maybe we need to reassess a little bit. But yeah, you're not expecting much clean sheet wise from Ipswich whatsoever. Davis, I still think at times this season, he's going to be a significant factor. And I think he's going to have one or two bigger hauls in him. It's just those have to come in the weeks where they're keeping clean sheets or likely to keep the clean sheets for us to ever really even consider owning them for that moment. And we're probably going to miss the inevitable 15 pointer once or twice a year from Davis, because it will come in a game that maybe we don't expect them to do that well in. Um, but, you know, at 4.5, he's a, he's a very reasonable option at that price point, And I wouldn't, hate anyone going there especially with good fixtures over a pretty long period of time similar with greaves he's okay as a four point a four million defender just to have on your bench and break glass in case of emergency kind of defender in a very decent fixture you could probably just about get away with playing him and hope that he comes in clutch with a header from a corner or something but yeah we're not generally looking at their defenders the player that i am interested in and i do genuinely rate very highly is delap i think yeah. he has a big premier league future he looks built for the premier league um obviously came through the city academy so he he knows what he's doing he's been coached well and he's getting coached well under mckenna now as well they do seem to be finding him more and more often he he just has everything I like in a striker about him. And I really do think he's going to have a good season this year. So I think he's underpriced. I think the data will improve with the fixtures coming. And I think mm. Ipswich are going to build a system which suits him more and more as time passes. So yeah, I'm I'm actually quite bullish on Delap for his price. I think he'll be a bit of an outlier at that at that price point. Yeah, I, I quite like him as a third striker, basically. Mm. Um, and I think that maybe there's a case to look at him and Strand Larson at some point in the, in the future as kind of like a bit of, um, they both got good fixtures and um, they might do quite well as being the 10th and 11th men if you can basically filter that money into owning a few of the bigger hitters altogether in a freemium sort of setup. Um, yeah, makes a lot of sense. So I think um, normally we have our kind of game week head preview. I think I'm going to, I think let's um, maybe take some time out of that and put it into discussing kind of the, the ramifications of this um because there are a few things that we've discussed like the knee jerk i think we can kind of skip that over and um, i think kind of top transfers we can leave at the moment as well I think there's definitely a lot of con contingencies on, on on the press conferences and things like that but we'll, we'll still do bold claims we'll still do um best captains in our teams but maybe we'll kind of take a bit of time out of that to just kind of discuss this a little bit sam mm -hmm. um so we started the conversation last week uh, with nick and um, adding in the discussions to the premiums and kind of how we were kind of managing them over the next few weeks, it does feel with the next four um, that we're in a bit of a holding pattern. Um, and at least Nick was with he owns Palmer and Saka. He wasn't looking at selling either of them on. Um, and it feels sort of, you know, form versus fixture is a real thing here. I mean, obviously Foden's the, kind of the stalking horse where you kind of be looking at him and thinking, well, is there a short-term gain to be had? But it does feel like a bit of a fallow one for many of the teams who are high in mind for us in terms of being contributors to our FPL sides um, of the Man City. And it, it does sort of feel like everything here should be, I suppose, working towards a... a the next swing really when the, when the players playing for the teams that we want to be emphasizing in our team construction are going to end up having a decent fixture swing like game week 12 plan needs to be discussed here despite not appearing on the sheet and handily we actually have that hooray <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I know there's a few other teams like you know uh, brighton who also their fixtures ameliorate significantly um but saka and palmer up until game week 20 so throughout the festive period 
do embark on a very very good run of fixtures um, and maybe having a plan to have those guys if you're kind of chopping and changing does need to be looked at so for example I said removing Watkins for Cunha or removing Trent for somebody else does mean I've got that money to then funnel into having a bit of a freemium strategy assuming that Haaland's going nowhere for me if you are going to be selling Haaland then it obviously makes things a lot easier uh, but the next um, you know the fixture run I'm not going to read it off because that's a bit boring for everybody I've read off a lot of fixture runs um, but it is so good that it, it does kind of go back to the idea of being a holding pattern, doesn't it, of the next four, just accepting there are going to be some weeks where you are treading water, maybe you will have to miss out on a short-term opportunity and keep your eye on the prize for the longer term. Yeah, absolutely. And it's certainly something that I've got my eye, eye on even this week looking ahead. I do have Saka. I don't have Palmer yet. And I think a lot of managers are in a similar situation with maybe one of the two right now and trying to figure out when the best moment is to just get the deal done and make sure that they're both in ahead of this good fixture run. Look, at no point are any players absolutely essential. You don't have to own them for this period, but I think it's fairly clear that these two players on penalties 90 minute men central to their team's attacking threat are going to be good owns for this run of fixtures all the way up to game week 20 for me with diaz being a significant issue in my side and i know a lot of managers also have a similar issue it's a question of do you use that as an opportunity even as early as now um, or maybe next game week when Liverpool's fixtures aren't looking or fixture isn't looking too great either as an opportunity to move across to the likes of Palmer especially rather than going to a Foden or a Son if he's fit for a good little run of fixtures but almost certainly booking in a transfer by the time you get to game week 12 and that's a decision that I'm weighing up myself at the moment whether or not I want to take a chance on one of the the sort of the beta picks rather than the alpha picks for the next few or do I just want to say you know what I'm going to save the transfer down the line I'm just going to go straight to Palmer make whatever sacrifices I need to now and hopefully that provides me with a much better base to build from by the time I get to game week 11 game week 12 I should have more transfers in the bank and I can start focusing on other issues in my side knowing that the three most important players Haaland included in this trio are already in situ and I can kind of just put them to one side and know that they're going to return me points for a significant amount of time yeah I mean that's literally it isn't it it's it's all about biding your time effectively and then taking those opportunities where you can despite the fixtures not being particularly favorable and um, it makes me think sam of like an rpg when you're waiting to hit the boss but you have to spend your time doing dodge and parry combos you know there's always that sort of like phase where you can hit the boss a phase mm. where the boss suddenly goes in- invulnerable and you've got to do dodges and parries and, and kind of uh, dodge basically all their attacks and stuff and then and then suddenly you can hit them again mm. and it does feel like this period is a bit like that unless you know there's things like what you said about getting something in place for the upcoming festive period in place early i mean it, it does all feel like this is kind of in service a little bit of the upcoming festive period where you'd be looking to roll transfers you'd be looking to um you know get get those pieces um of the jigsaw in place as soon as you possibly can um, and I think that that kind of is, is, is how next four is looking. It's not the most exciting next four. Um, on lot, and I think there will be potentially a few sort of weeks where you are looking at your edge pieces effectively coming through for you. You may see like a Semenyo, as we mentioned, coming off the bench and with a, with a random goal, hoping for the best out of that. Or, you know, maybe be shuffling players around. So if you'd maybe taken Semenyo again, maybe you would be deciding, okay, well, I don't, I, maybe there is a bit of a, an option to grab i don't know a savinho or something like that if they're looking if, if he does looking like he's going he's going to be starting or if you've only got two arsenal getting a trossard in um especially with martinelli apparently also suffering an ib injury or a johnson too if you don't know him for spurs um so yeah um i think one of those periods which is going to be a bit of a holding pattern and it's just about i suppose managing it cleverly but making sure you've got in mind how you're going to be getting to no one's essential but um, getting to a place you're going to be happy with in game week 12 um, it, it's not unfair to say that a wild card 6 team and a wild card uh, 12 team I think are going to have some similarities to them and it's just this little period is, is, is always going to be a bit of a difficult one for FPL managers that's for sure 
Cool. All right. Uh, so game of preview, as I said, we're going to take some time out of this one um, and skip over a couple of things. Normally we do knee jerk, best transfers um, and so on and so forth. I think we're going to leave the knee jerk, uh, leave the best transfers this week and go on to the bold claim straight away. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we don't, I don't think we either got any success this game week. Um, it feels like a long time ago it now. Does. I actually ago. forgot what mine was, but um. Sad, sadly, um, looking at it, it was apparently a Leaf Davis 10-pointer, which um, I, I'm still bullish that it will happen at some point. I think he's got it in him. Um, clearly did not happen um, in game week seven. It was West Ham, was it? They lost 4-1? I really have to jog yeah. my memory there. Yeah, it was, yeah. um, he actually got a zero-pointer, I think, because he lost the two points for the he goals did. conceded. So, yeah, not great. And obviously, at least you did bench him, Tom. So but you're much wiser than me on that one. But uh, you didn't have any more luck than me with the bowl claim this week, did you? No, I was expecting uh, Villa to show up since Man United and um, they did not understand the assignment or well, they did understand the assignment to use some Gen Z parlance um, if we kind of uh, if we were thinking that we wanted Ten Hag to stay in place um, although I was, I was kind of hoping that they beat uh, Villa uh, they beat United just because you know, I've got a bold claim <laughs> sitting there waiting um, for the week uh, for, for the year um, nice to get one of those off uh, for the week ahead for the week ahead, um, I've gone with uh, a Tom classic. I've gone for a five goals plus. Um, in this this week, I've gone with Newcastle versus Brighton. I think that's going to be a bit end to end. It's almost directly in contradiction, I think, to your bold claim, although maybe not completely directly. Um, but there's definitely a correlation or an anti correlation there. So it'll be interesting to see what type of game week this game week will be after the international break, which I'm assuming is the cause of yours. Yeah. I mean, Newcastle and Brighton, five goals. That's not going to give anyone any joy, is it? No. Really? It's not going to own any of those players. And um, yes, um, I, I definitely like those. Um, I've got an average game week score of below 40 points. I think that will pass the Forest test. That's one of those which is very hard to get bookies odds on. Um, yeah, that, I, that is bold enough. 40 is low. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's full of... Uh, Full of enthusiasm again for FPL, I'm sure. Um, uh, but I'm just betting with damn squid, basically. Um, obviously, a lot of that hinges on uh, on Harland uh, being keeping quiet, um, and and uh, Bournemouth scoring. Um, but I, I don't think that either of those two things are too far uh, from uh, from the realms of possibility, but far enough to make it a bold claim. So yeah, average game week score below forty points. It doesn't have to be our scores, by the way. It's just the average. Um, yeah, the, of forty points. Uh, best captains this week. <laughs> I, I mean, we didn't skip mm -hmm. it, but I think it, I think it is quite a short one. Um, if you are a Holland owner, and I think the vast majority of people um, in FPL are Holland owners, um, this is a no-brainer. Um, I don't think that there's any kind of yes, you could well end up. Um, if you'd go elsewhere and take him on, even if you do own him and you do get those points, well done to you. Um, but it's one of those where I think it's a bit of a no-brainer. I mean, elsewhere, if you don't own Haaland, Sam, I suppose it is. Uh, Saka versus Bournemouth, maybe even yeah. Mo Salah. Old club Chelsea, a bit of flavour there. I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, could, honestly. Saka, Saka, Salah, Palmer, they're never bad picks. Um, but Haaland away even away against one of the worst defenses in the league so far this season with a depleted defense yeah you fancy it um so uh yeah Haaland would definitely be the the number one captain for me Sa Saka probably number two ahead of Salah um but yeah any of those if you don't have Haaland are probably fine and you might be able to bag yourself a big haul because they're capable of it in any single game week perfect all right and um our teams for game week eight to end up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, you're first up, Tom. Okay, uh, so probably looking to roll unless something kind of happens. I think it's always good post international break. I always feel like the the outcome post international break is never particularly strong in terms of overall points. Reflects my role claim. Um, but yeah, in a four four two at the moment, um, Semenyo is on the bench and Davis has come on as per the wild card plan. I'm going to set up the. The, the bench um, near the time. I've got Stuart, Semenyo and Mikalenko. Um, Stuart and Mikalenko are both flagged at the moment, so I don't really know what's going to happen with those two. I'll figure all that out. 
uh, Ray and Goal, uh, Gabriel Lewis, uh, Trent and Davis, so who's making his debut for me uh, at the back. Uh, Johnson, Bumo, Rogers, and Sacco, who's got the vice, and then Harland and Watkins up top as usual. Uh, Harland with the armband. Um, we'll see how that one goes. Nice rolling out the 4 4 2, the old school Nick 4 4 2. What about you? Where's this chaos grenade then, Sam? You've been promised one. Right then, so three free transfers and Luis Diaz is stinking up my side at the moment. So I have options and I think in most scenarios, I probably do need to look at getting rid of him this week. Um, I could, and this is just devil's advocate, I could just leave it and hope he starts or just put in Semenyo, for instance, for him and then I'll get four next week at a better point, at a better entry point for the likes of Palmer. However, there are a few different routes I like. So number one, the chaos grenade, is, as we keep referring to it as, um, would be a triple swap, all three free transfers, get rid of both of the Liverpool boys, Diaz and Trent, but also get rid of Calvert-Lewin um, for the triple up of Palmer, Aitnuri and Delap. Now, Aitnuri would be benched in this scenario and I'd bring in either Mikalenko if fit, if not, Greaves will have to make do. It's obviously not ideal. And look, Palmer does not have a good game this week, but I'm banking on the fact that if I'm going to use, in this scenario anyway, if I'm going to use a free transfer to get rid of Diaz now, I might as well bring in the player that long term I want for a very well, basically for the remainder of the season. Why am I wasting time looking at bringing in a, a sort of a makeshift player just for a couple of weeks when I know really the player I want to get to is Palmer and I'm reducing my chances of getting to him quickly by wasting free transfers? So that's my logic on Palmer. Um, I do like Delap a lot, as we've mentioned on this pod. and. I wouldn't like to get rid of Calvert-Lewin because I like the fixtures and I still think he's absolutely fine to own, but I need to find that extra 0.2 somewhere to make this move viable. And that's the way that I could basically make it work at the moment. So Ooh. that would be the chaos grenade. Oh, I really like that. Honestly, I, I feel like that's, um, it just feels like you're using those free transfers very wisely. When you, you're very wise, Sam. When I text you with wow. some kind of half-assed opinion, you're very quick at providing me a very grounded answer. And I'm like, oh yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. When I, when I t- uh, texted you about Tuchel earlier. You were like, oh, here's why I think it's a good, good move. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'm excited now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that you know, all of those make a lot of sense, honestly. Um, and it feels like you, they're players that you have longevity basically for you as you said you cut out the middleman you just think you know what i'm setting up for the future and those long-term sort of investments could pay dividends for you so i really like that i don't think it's much of a chaos grenade i was wondering whether you'd be really kind of off the wall i know you've discussed it on on your own channel in your video which i facility which i've studiously avoided the last couple of days um yeah, I, I really like that actually. actually. Mm. I, I think that's a really, really good move. And you've and you know, you've you've got players in place that you can just kind of be happy that you know it's a peace of mind thing that we've discussed in the past. Yeah, I I think so that's option A. Option B very quickly would be Foden. Um I have a have a feeling he's about to go big and I do like him against Wolves and Southampton. And I do if I'm gonna do it, I wanna do it now. So again, it would be the two Liverpool boys and it would be Foden with probably Eitnuri. At the start of the week, it was going to be Porro, but I'm just not sure if he's one million better than Eitnuri at the moment, considering they're not really keeping the clean sheets. And I think I can use that one million elsewhere in the next few weeks, um, especially to get to Palmer more easily when the fixtures truly do turn. So that's my second option. Um, and then third option would obviously be just a bit of a boring swap Diaz down to like a Johnson or something. but. I just, I just don't know if that gets me closer to the team I want long term, and I'd prefer to use yeah. my three free transfers to really make some waves and get ahead of the template a little bit. Whereas if I do anything else, I feel like I'm just another week behind. Um, so yeah, I've got some decision making to do, but it's, it is reassuring that you at least didn't like spit out your drink and call me an idiot as soon as I mentioned the the triple move because I think a few people might. No, no, I, I don't see why they would, though. That's the thing. I mean, maybe there's going to be some opposition to removing Trent. 
Mm. But other than or that, getting Palmer mm. this week against Liverpool. But I genuinely don't think that's a problem. No, it's not a problem at all. I mean, we discussed that he could probably be um, on a par with, with Salah of old. That yeah. He just could return to any game. We discussed kind of the reality of that and also getting in that Saka Palmer double up from the off. I mean, you, that's the best way of using the looking at these next four points. I'm a little bit jealous because, as we've mentioned, it's a holding pattern, right? So you've got those players in place. You know the fixtures aren't particularly, aren't particularly great. That there's not the teams that you want to be targeting other than Man City, where we've both got uh, Haaland and we've both got Lewis. And do you want to add, add another one? Like maybe, but you know, it's, it's not the end of the world if you don't. I yeah, mean, it's not going to hurt you. Yeah, it makes so much sense. Long term investment, honestly. I mean, we'll see. We'll see where you come to after press conferences. But I mean, if you do 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 that, I mean that that's that's a really sort of um, sound set of moves in my eyes. Mm, that's reassuring. Yeah, I was maybe forty sixty against it. Now I'm maybe sixty forty for it after hearing your opinion on it. So yeah, I'll I'll do do some more thinking on it. I'd like to mix it up a little bit. And I'm honestly, I'm just so bullish on Palmer. I think he is the next big thing now. So yeah, I, I would like him in my team ASAP, ideally. And I think that might be a nice way to just get it done. Um, mm. and, and meanwhile, also make some calculated gamble, like gambles on the likes of Ike Nuri and Delap, who I both really like. Um, so, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I, I quite I, like it. I'm, I've got more of a problem because I can't get Palmer. You, you can get him straight away. I can't do that because I've got Watkins. And I, sure. I feel like I've, I've got yeah. to see Watkins over the next three as discussed. So, Fulham, uh, yeah. Bournemouth. I like those fixtures for him. They, I think you'll do, do well with him there. They're, they're fine. And I don't have the free transfers to do it. So, it, you, I'm going to have to wait for a little bit with Trent in place as well. So, that's a bit, a bit more of a piecemeal thing for me. And I suppose that's the beauty of the the format right now that you can do that and then you're mm. there without incurring the points here and suddenly you've got a, a, a massively refreshed team maybe not the fixtures but in terms of the players and that is that's absolutely fine um so yeah it makes a lot of sense i'm i'm, I'm pretty jealous of, of that and there's nowhere i can get to anywhere near that with my team at the moment um, so yeah I, I look forward to you chipping chipping away at my lead and then taking it away or losing more ground <laughs> no that's not going to happen is it i mean the play apart from selling trent i don't really see any problem with selling calvert lewin who i'm not particularly um infused by i say that and obviously he goes off and scores a brace i don't mm. really mind about selling Diaz especially after international break uh trent a bit more iffy i'll probably be keeping him this week um at the end of the day, if we discussed how it could be a sacrifice that would make a lot of sense to a lot of people um, if you're trying to make money elsewhere. I mean, the, the, the calculation there is basically Trent versus Palmer, and I take Palmer every time. Yeah, fair point, fair point. Um, although I do like that DCL fixture now. You've mentioned him specifically against Ipswich. They've been very poor. Anyway, yeah. let's not let's not ramble on too much about my team specifically because <laughs> I know that we cater for all people, not, not just to try and work out my moves. But uh, yeah, hopefully you've all enjoyed listening to us talk about all 20 sides or pretty much all 20. We've missed out a couple, I think, but hopefully you'll forgive us because they weren't that that FPL relevant. Um, but it's been great to get back into the swing of things. An hour and a half of... Great podding again with you, Tom. I've really enjoyed it. And hopefully if you've been watching along out there, you have too. Um, we were who got the assist. You can find us on X at WGTA underscore FPL, myself at FPL Pricey on there. And Instagram and threads, it's WGTA.FPL. And again, I'm just FPL Pricey on there. If you did enjoy the pod, we'd really appreciate it if you could do one or all of the following. That includes following us on those social channels. But also, if you could give the pod a five-star rating wherever you're listening, that'd be great. And if you're watching along on YouTube, then please do remember to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It genuinely really does help us out. Nice one. Thank you very much, Sam. We hope you enjoyed the pod. We hope you assisted you. Next week, we'll be back on Monday. Uh, back on Mondays again after this. Apologies again. We're a day late. I believe there's a Forest Palace game in the background, but I don't think that's going to affect anyone really. Enjoy the first weekend back. Hopefully, my bowl claim is not in void and we all have a great time with loads of points, especially if you're going to FPL meets. Um, it is on Saturday. It's the first bear in Waterloo from midday onwards. At FPL Meets on Twitter, I'll be there probably about sort of three, four-ish, um, just because I've got some childcare and stuff, so it's hangover. Are you, are you going this this time, Sam? 
No, unfortunately, I'm at a, oh, a friend's birthday this time, birthday. but uh, I, it will be with a heavy heart. Um, he's quite into FPL, so I might try and drag him there for a little bit if I'm lucky, but um, I don't think so. That would be no. quite far-fetched. So no, maybe next cool. time, but enjoy enjoy yourselves, guys, if you go along. It is great fun. Yeah, and if you are going on your own, um, don't be afraid to come and find me. I'm sure you know what I look like. Um, <laughs> and uh, so if you are going, I'll see you there. If not, us, we will speak to you uh, next week. Oh, it's a goal. Who got the assist? Who got the assist? This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.